Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter number 16, please. <clears throat> I want you to pray for me. I, not boastfully, but I was very happily happy to state yesterday that the pollen did not seem to be bothering me, that my voice was holding up just fine, everything was going well. Well, uh, I'm about sung and preached out today. And so I'm assuming it's probably the pollen, either that or the way the kids acted all week, me yelling at them and screaming at them. I'm not sure which it is. Amen. It wasn't, it wasn't the latter. I do pray the Lord would help us. I need a physical touch and, and pray the Lord would. Um, I know this time of year is very, very hard on a lot of people. And so I, I'm certainly not complaining in any sense of the word because I know a lot of people as you uh, are coughing and hacking and uh, all the other things that come along with seasonal allergies. I am relatively not suffering. I thank the Lord for it. It does affect my voice just a little bit. So you pray the Lord would help us. Uh, just before we get into the message, read our text. Let me uh, mention, I told you I'd give you the, the total on the faith promise. I'm happy to report to you. Lord's bless us. And uh, the faith promise pledges that have come in are... Uh, Per month, $3,370 per month, which I believe, Miss Brenda, is a pretty good increase from last year, uh, as Faith Promise. So that's encouraging. Uh, that'll be $40,440 in the year. That's not including extra offerings and things. That's just the Faith Promise. And so I want to thank you for getting involved in Faith Promise Missions Giving. I promise you this, uh, you will not... You will not be disappointed. And what the Lord does is you are faithful to give what the Lord has impressed upon your heart. You, uh, you give it every month or week or however it is that you stated and the Lord will bless you. And uh, I've seen that time and time again. So what an exciting thing it is to be able to look at the missions program, see a, a forward progress. And uh, I appreciate your, your obedience to the Lord your faithfulness in giving, your sensitivity, and uh, we will be praying that the Lord would direct us as we, uh, we've had some missionaries this past year come off the field and, and, and different things, and so we'll uh, do our best to mind the Lord and uh, of any decisions that will be made, and, and of course we've got missionaries uh, booked throughout the rest of this year as well that will be coming in. We've got a missions trip coming up in uh, July and into August, and we're excited about that. It's going to be a great trip, and I encourage everyone that can possibly uh, try your best to make plans to go with us uh, out to Whitewater, Montana. We will have a day of sightseeing. We're going to go down to Yellowstone. If you've never been out there, it'll be a good opportunity for you to see that. And uh, the rest of it's going to be a work trip, all right? And you're going to, you're going to work, 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 work. You're going to sightsee one day, and then you're going to ride home, which is work, 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 work. If you've ever driven across from the west to the east, it's work. So you pray about that. Looking forward to a great summer. Got a lot of things planned. Camps are coming up and all those things. All right, Matthew chapter number 16. If you would, found your place, stand with me. As we read another familiar passage of Scripture, verse number 17 is where we'll begin our reading. Read three verses here. We'll be a couple other places in the Bible as we go through this. Uh, and, and as the Lord has directed us to preach on the church tonight. I love the church. And uh, I love all things about the church. And we'll talk a little bit about the church tonight. Matthew 16, verse number 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, or shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon the reading of your word. I pray that you would speak to us, speak through us, and Lord, that you'd get glory and honor for yourself. Lord, I pray that you would let us see the church, the importance of the church, the glory of being a part of the church. And Lord, we'll bless you and thank you for all you do. Help us now. Guard my lips, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Uh, let's go back as we read verse number 18. The Bible said, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church. 
What rock is that speaking of? Now, many have erroneously conceived that that is speaking of Peter and that the Lord was saying that the church would be built upon Peter. That is a popular thought in Roman Catholicism. They, uh, they have uh, promoted Peter as the first pope and that uh, popal line comes down through him. And that is not what Scripture is teaching at all. In fact, if you miss this, you miss the entire foundation of the church and the entire foundation of who we are and what we believe. The foundation that God is speaking of here here is found in verse number 16. Let's start in verse 15. And he said unto them, But whom say ye, Jesus is speaking, but whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the rock, that truth that Jesus is the Son of the living God. He is the Christ. That is the rock, the very foundation that the church would be built upon. Can I tell you that is the foundation that the church has been built upon? It is Christ, the rock, the chief cornerstone. All things in regards to the church tie back to Jesus Christ as our cornerstone, as our foundation. We never deviate from the Lord Jesus Christ. Anytime the church leaves Christ and goes toward man, you're leaving your foundation. I will say this, there's a lot of counterlevers in the church, it seems like. Uh, in building, if you know what a counterlever is, it simply is exactly what it says. You, you build a portion of something in the building and then you allow it to extend beyond the building. So you may have a room on the second floor that is what is called counterlevered. In other words, the majority of the room would be inside the foundation of the house, but then there would be a section that reaches outside and it spans outside of the foundation. Said all that to say this, if that room goes too far, that room will fall off of the house and cause great damage. Why? Because it extends over the foundation. Can I tell you what's happening in a lot of churches today? They're building a lot of ministries that started somewhere back in the church on the foundation, but they counterlevered out. They said, well, we're going to be anchored here, but we're going to reach out past the foundation. We're going to reach out past Christ a little bit. We're going to leave a little bit of that behind. And then in so doing, they continue to build and continue to build and continue to build until it has caused great harm to the church because they got way too far out over the foundation. Amen. Never leave the foundation. That's Jesus Christ. And uh, so we see that in the church. We see it happening in the church. I want to say as I start off this message that I love the church. I love the church before I was saved. I've loved the church every moment since I was saved. I grew up a church boy. I grew up in the house of God. My entire life has always revolved around church. I've never known anything but church. I've never known a part of my life when I did not get up on Sunday morning and go to church. I do not say that boastfully. I do say that very humbly. I do say that very honored to have had that life. I'm not complaining about the life that I've had. I bless the Lord that has never in my entire life been a question of what we would do on Sunday morning. It was the Lord's day. There was no question about it. We got up and we went to the house of the Lord. I'm glad to say that on Sundays when we're out of town and on vacation, we still got up and we went to the house of God. Amen. That's how I found out there were nuts out there. Amen. You don't believe that? Go on vacation and visit a local church. You're going to find out there's some nuts out there. And uh, we got in some dudes. I remember one time as a, as a young boy, we went on vacation. I believe we were in Florida somewhere and we decided we were going to get up and we, we looked in the phone book and we found a Baptist church that was close by and, and, and we got there and we pulled up good and early like we, you know, we're normally there early and we got there good and early so we might meet some people and fellowship a little bit before church started and, and uh, there was, we, we saw somebody get out of the car and uh, we said, well, what about that? This is a multicultural church. Then we saw somebody else get out of the car and somebody else get out of the car and somebody else get out of the car. And we found out it was not a multicultural church. It was just a different cultural church. <laughs> Amen. In fact, as we sat in the parking lot, we realized we were the only, and please understand I'm not being racist. I'm, I'm telling you a story, so don't say it's what it ain't. 
we just looked around and realized we were the only white people at the church. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I mean, I praise the Lord for it. I've told you one of my lifelong goals is to pastor a thousand people with a black choir. Amen. I'm still pressing toward it. We're, we're building the choir. We're working on their tans, but we're building them right now. <laughs> Amen. Building the choir. Brother Richard, a couple of years ago, we did that one song at the Christmas cantata. That had that, uh, it had just that feel to it. And I thought, ooh, Lord, he's answering my prayer. Oh, yes. But anyway, I get back into the message now. I just simply said this, when you're out like that, you get into some circumstances you wouldn't normally get into. And what a blessing it is to stretch out a little bit uh, in the things of God. And, and so what I, all of that to say this one simple thing, we didn't miss church on Sundays. Amen. It looks like I could have just said we didn't miss church on Sundays. And I know that would have cut out five minutes of the message. Uh, but nonetheless, we always went to church. I don't know what it is not to be in church. And I thank the Lord for that. I know what it is not to want to go to church. I mean, we might as, all, might as well, everybody, go ahead and admit and shake your head. Even since you've been saved, you know what it is not to feel like going to church. Nobody here is so spiritual that you wake up every single Sunday morning and say, man, I get to go to church today. There's just sometimes you get up and you don't feel good. In fact, sometimes we have gotten up and we've sat on the bed trying to convince ourselves we didn't feel good. <laughs> trying to debate if we felt bad enough to stay home. Come on and help me. Somebody's had that argument. Trying to decide if that little thing in your stomach was simply because you ate too late the night before or maybe you were coming down with something and you sat there and sat there on the edge of the bed and many times you may have convinced yourself, boy, I, I, just, boy, I, I may be coming down with something. I better stay home so I don't get anybody else sick. <laughs> Help me now. I'm just simply saying that's what we do from time to time because we're flesh. But can I say there is something down in the depths of my soul that on Sunday morning, on Sunday night, on Wednesday night, even when my flesh says I don't feel like it, when my flesh says I don't need to, when my flesh says take the day off, there's something down in my spirit that says, hey, we're going to the house of God because that's where we go when the church is having church. Hey, Amen. I love the church. I love the church. I love everything about the church. I love the singing in the church. I love singing. I love good singing. We've got good singing. I love the singing of the church. A lot of times when I come in in the uh, Sunday morning service, the choir has already started or the congregation singing has already started. If we prayed maybe a little bit longer than we do normally and, and, the, the, and I can come out of my office and before I even get to the fellowship hall door, I can hear the singing. Man, something swells up in the depths of my soul that says, hallelujah, I'm going to church. We walk in the doors and they're singing the good songs of Zion or maybe we start up here and I'm, I'm standing over here in front of my, my little seat here and, and people begin to sing and I look around and say, praise the Lord, man, we are in church. I'm telling you, I love the church. I love the singing of the church. I love the preaching of the church. Last Tuesday, we were able to be in a service all day, three different services in one day. And uh, we heard, I guess, six different messages that day. And what a blessing it was. Every time they announced the preacher that was coming, whether I knew him or not, I said, praise the Lord, there's a man of God getting in the pulpit. He's going to open up the Bible and he's going to preach the word of God to me. And there is an opportunity here for me to hear from heaven. And six times in one day, I had the opportunity to hear from a man of God, take the word of God and speak to the people of God. What a blessing it is to hear the preaching down at the church. I love I love the preaching of the church. I love the people of the church. Oh, I love you. I love every one of you. Amen. I love you and you love me and we love each other. Amen. You may get aggravated with me, but you love me. Praise the Lord. That's good because I get aggravated with you and I love you. So it's, the feeling's mutual. We love each other. We, we care about each other. I love the people of the church. I love the people of, of the church, not only here in this local assembly, I love the people of, of the churches that we get to go in and out of. What a precious family this is, the family of 
blood-bought believers that are scattered around the world. No matter where it's been, no matter what churches I've been in, there's a blessing of being able to shake a brother's hand and tell him you love him in the Lord and that you, uh, it's a pleasure to meet him. You get to worship together. I'm telling you, if you know of a better people than the church, tell me I've got to meet them. Because this group of people that make up the church, this group of people called Christians, this group of people called believers in my book, Brother Ken, are the greatest group of people I ever met in my life. I mean, I love them. I, I meet, I, I got Christians from up north that I love. Yeah. <laughs> amen. Say amen, Brother Hugh. Amen. amen. <laughs> I'm teasing. It's not, it's not a northern thing or a southern thing or a western thing or an eastern thing. It's not an American thing. It's a Lord Jesus thing. It's the blood-bought believers. I, I love the people of the church. The church is not an organization as many have taught and many have claimed. The church is an organism. It's a living, breathing organism. And when we look at the church, we look at it differently because of that very thing. You see, an organization, you can organize and everything will flow correctly. But a church cannot be organized to flow. It must have a life source to flow. You take all the organization in the world and put it into the church without the life and all you have is a form of worship and an empty service, but you take someone that maybe does not have the greatest organizational skills. Hey Amen. You take somebody that may not be the most organized person and you put them in a group of people where there is life and that thing comes alive and, and it flourishes and the people are blessed and helped and worship takes place. I, I just love the church. That's what I'm trying to say. I love the church. Let me mention a couple of things about the church tonight and we'll, we'll be done. Go with me to Ephesians chapter number five. Let me preach for just a minute on what the church is. Ephesians chapter number five. What is the church exactly? Many things could be said here. Ephesians chapter five teaches us something about the church. It teaches us that the church is a body. Something we need to remember as the, the body of Christ as a whole, we are the body of Christ. And as a local assembly, the local assembly operates also as a body. And we'll mention that in just a moment. The Bible said in verse number 21 of Ephesians 5, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, listen, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of what? The body. We find that the church is a body and many things are mentioned throughout scripture uh, that describe the church as a body. We're told that the church is made up of many members just as our physical bodies are made up of many members. You have feet, you have legs, you have hands, you have arms, you have fingers, you have a neck, you have, you have all these different things and it all makes up your body. We refer to our head as a head, but we can also refer to it as a part of the body because it's not, it's not separate from the body. It is a part of the body and, and you ought to rejoice over that because the Bible said Christ is our church or Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the body. So that means he is not separate from the body. He is a part of the body. Therefore, we get to be a part of what Christ is a part of. He's the head of the body. The head is the life of the body. You say, no, preacher, that is the heart. The heart is the life of the body. Well, tell me, have you ever had your heart underwater? When your heart was underwater, were you still living okay? Amen. I've had my heart underwater several times and I live just fine. But you get my head underwater, there's going to be problems if I don't come up. Somebody say amen. So my heart, although there's a life-giving substance, the blood, and I'm not taking away from the blood, that, that life flows from the blood, but you take the head away and the body dies. Why? Because it is your head that tells your body to do everything that it does. The heart is what is called an involuntary muscle. It beats, it beats, it beats, it beats, it beats, it beats. You can cut the head off and for a little while, the blood will continue to beat. The heart will continue to pound because it's an involuntary uh, muscle. 
But you take it away for very long and it's not going to continue to live. So we see the head is the life of the body. It's the, it's, it's the life source. It's what tells us what to do. It's what keeps us going. You, you don't have a head. You don't have a body. And we simply say that to point out this fact. You take Christ away. And I've already preached about it being the foundation. You take Christ away. And we don't have anything to stand on any longer. We cannot live. You say, oh, we have love. And as long as we have love, we have a, we're okay. Let me tell you why you have love. You have love because Christ is love. God is love. That's the only reason you have love is because of who Christ is and because you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You take Christ away and you will not live as the church. We cannot make it without our head. The head, of the, the head is the life of the body. Secondly, the head is the leader of the body. We're given the description or given the command of how the home is supposed to operate. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the, head, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Sometimes people get so offensive about that passage of Scripture, they can't get the gravity of that passage of Scripture. The Bible is telling us that the, that the man or the husband is the head of the home and the head of the woman. I know the Bible is teaching that, but there's a greater truth that the Bible is teaching there also. And that is that Christ is the head of the church, the head of the body. And just as the, the head of the home is the one who leads the home, the head of the church is the one who leads the church. That's why we do not deviate from Scripture. That's why we consult and concern with what Christ believes and what Christ taught and what Christ said about the church. Why? Because he is the head, the leader of the church. We know that God's given us pastors and as pastors, the head of the local assembly and the leader of the local assembly. But yet, as far as the church is concerned, Christ is the head of the church. This is the Lord's church. It's the Lord's work. He is the head. He simply has bestowed upon me the privilege of being an under-shepherd, if you will, of leading, uh, leading a local assembly. But we're a part of Christ. He's the head. Amen. Y'all could get rid of me. I pray you don't. Amen. Amen. If you're really thinking about it, think again. Reconsider it. Amen. Don't... Listen, I love my bike, but I can't ride it too far, so don't get rid of me. <laughs> Amen. By the way, I, I do love it. Thank you again for that. Y'all get them. We'll go riding together sometime. I'm coming after you, Brother Kenny. I, I'm coming after you. Yeah, last time we talked about that mountain bike, and I, I said, are you going to run off and leave me? He said, yeah. <laughs> I mean, at least he was honest. I'm coming at you. Amen. I'm pretty sure... After I ride for about three more weeks and loosen all the bolts on his bicycle, I can beat him. <laughs> I'm saying is don't get rid of me. But if you got rid of me, if you were for some reason to tell me to leave and tell me I was no longer welcome to be the pastor, you gathered together and you voted me out. Guess what, church? You could survive. Why? Because I'm not the head. I'm just under the head. I'm the leader of the locals, and we know that, but Christ is the head. And as long as Christ is living, as long as Christ is on the throne, the church is going to be okay. Amen. I bless the Lord for that. So the head is the life of the body. The head is the leader of the body. But the head is the lover of the body. Amen. You don't believe that your head loves your body? Think about how quickly your head gets your body out of harm's way. Amen. You don't, you don't really think about it. You don't understand what all goes on in your mind when suddenly you realize harm is coming to you. And your head just naturally tells you you need to move from where you are because if you stay where you are, you are going to be harmed. And so you don't even think you're, whoop, you're out of the way. Why? Your head loves you. Your head does not want you to be harmed. If your head does intend for you to be harmed, you have a head problem. And that's real. I'm not saying it's not real. There's people facing that kind of thing all around. I understand that. I'm not belittling, but I will tell you it is a mental problem for someone to desire to hurt their own body. Because it is natural for the head to love the body. 
other day, I'm trying to think of what I was doing, Brother Philip. I was doing something, had a, had a big piece of wood. And it slipped out of my hands. You know, I didn't, I don't remember telling my feet to move, but you should have seen the dance <laughs> that I danced when that thing slipped out of my hands. I don't remember saying, okay, feet, you need to move now because if you don't, great harm is going to come to you. I don't remember any of that. I mean, it slipped out of my hands. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Natural. Why? My head loves my body. Y'all getting that? Amen. Why does the church do what the church does from time to time? Some people would look at it and say it doesn't make sense. Some people would look at it and say, I don't understand the direction they're going, but we've got a head that loves the body. And sometimes the head tells the body to do things to keep the body out of harm's way because the head is a lover of the body. Can you imagine Christ loves the church? Christ loves us. He loves the body. So what is the church? It's a body. Secondly, what does the church need? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter number 12. I love this passage of Scripture. Hebrews chapter number 12. What's the church need? We saw what the church is. Now let's look at what the church needs. The Bible said in Hebrews 12 verse number 1, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down to the right hand of the throne of God. Five things here that the church needs. Mentioned in these two verses, number one, it needs inspiration. The church needs some inspiration. And the Bible said we had that inspiration. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. I'm not going to take time to do it, but if you go back and read through Hebrews chapter number 11, you have a great cloud of witnesses that are mentioned of faithful men and women who serve God, live for God, laid down their lives for the cause of Christ. And God, taking us into, into Hebrews chapter number 12, says, look back to chapter number Number 11 and realize the grandstand of heaven is watching you. They're looking down on you. They're the witnesses. They've already been here. They've already run the race. They've already conquered the foe. They've already been victorious and they're looking to you now. And if that doesn't inspire you, I remember when I was in school, there was, uh, I came up, started playing football in the ninth grade and I was playing football with some seniors and there were some seniors there. Man, I, I didn't look up to them spiritually spiritually, didn't look up to them in any kind of uh, a moral way. But man, when it came to football, they were the cream of the crop. And I looked at some of those guys and uh, I, I remember uh, Bulldog and Shane Balcom. They were, were they in your group? They were in your grade. So they were seniors when I was a freshman. Bulldog was, I don't know, he probably weighed 300 or something pounds Solid rock. I mean, he was, he was massive, Brother Keith. I'm talking about massive. He had no neck. His shoulders went directly to his ears. He was a stump. I mean, he was just huge. He could bench press the school. <laughs> he ran out of weight, so he just got under the school and bench pressed it. I mean, he was massive. And I remember as a freshman just starting to play football, and I would watch him play football, and I would watch him on that line, and I would watch these guys line up in front of him, Brother Philip, and, and I would watch them go, <clears throat> as they lined up in front of him. I would watch them get down. You know, some guys, when they're excited about playing football, and they don't care who's a kid, man, they get down to that stage, they're like, whoo, I, I'd watch these guys walk up. <laughs> they're scared to death. I thought, oh man, that's what I want. I want to get on that field and I want them to be scared of me. I mean, I, by the time I'm done, I want them to say, Bulldog who? That was, that was my thinking. <laughs> Shane Balkum, we, we wrestled some together. And I remember as a freshman wrestling with Shane, I would get out on the mat and I couldn't hardly wrestle for shaking. Scared to death of him. He turned me into every which way. He did moves on me that I'm pretty sure are illegal in most high schools. He turned me in knots. I could have been a pretzel. Amen. 
I mean, it was bad, Brother Ken. He would, I would think I was pretty strong. I'd get to wrestle with some of these other guys and think I'm getting about where I need to be. I'd step in that little circle with shame and he would turn me in a knot so fast and then tie me and then go get a sip of water and wait for me to beg him to come untie me. I mean, it's bad. It's bad. And I remember, I, I remember one day when I was a junior, I got on the football field, Brother Philip, and we'd done our pregame warm up and everything. We'd run through the banner. We're standing over on the sideline. I felt a hand come over my shoulder. An arm come over. He said, Biddy, just want you to know I'm rooting for you tonight. Go out there and whoop somebody. And I looked, and it was the eyes of Bulldog. Bulldog on the sideline rooting me on. You know what I did? I showed Bulldog what a bull mastiff looked like. <laughs> Amen. I said, Bulldog, you're an English Bulldog. I'm a bull mastiff, just so you know. I mean, there was something about that, Brother Richard. I, it did something inside me. Why? Because I knew if I got out there and failed, someone I looked to, someone I admired, was watching me fail. So it did something in me that said, I don't want to fail. I remember a similar experience in wrestling. I remember one day we were in a tournament and I was getting ready to go into the finals of that tournament. I'd come through, wrestled all day. I was going into the final match. It was for the championship. It was me or the other guy. We, one of us was going to be gold and the other was going to be silver. And I never have much like silver. <laughs> I remember Shane walked up to me, shook my hand. He said, Biddy, you got this, man. He said, you got this. He said, never did tell you this, but he said, I was always worried about wrestling you. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> worried about wrestling me. Brother Scott, it did something for me. I went out on that mat and I won. I did win. But I didn't win, win. I won. <laughs> I took the gold medal in 23 seconds. I pinned the guy. Say why? Because I was highly motivated when I got on the mat. Because I had a witness on the side that I respected and admired. I wonder if we could do that as the people of God to realize that Paul has run this race, to realize Peter has run this race, to realize that Moses and Abraham and the great men of the Bible have run this race, to realize that D.L. Moody and Charles Spurgeon and Billy Sunday, they've run this race and now they're looking at us and saying, hey, run the race, run the race, stay faithful, run the race. We've got inspiration. The church needs inspiration. Secondly, the church needs elim elimination. Seeing we're compassed about a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Be real good once we get inspired to unload some things. I mean, we really, from time to time, need to unload some things. There are things we carry as Christians that Christ never intended for us to carry. There are weights that we carry that were never intended for us to carry. There are sins that bother us that were intended to bother us. And God said, get rid of those things. Laying aside every weight and the sin with us so easily beset us. That's elimination. Third thing we need, we need operation. The Bible said... And the sin was those easily beset us, and let us run. Let us run. There's no substitution for running. Amen. There's no substitution for going. There's no substitution for doing. That's what the church needs. We need operation. Once we've been inspired to run the race, once we've eliminated the weights that would hinder us from running the race, what is left to do but to run the race? They've already pulled the trigger on the little gun. The race has already started. If you're not running now, you're behind. We need operation. We need to run. Not only do we need operation, we need determination. The Bible said, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Patience. Now, I know we don't pray for patience. You've heard that before, haven't you? I don't pray for patience because the process of getting is awful hard. I have found you really don't have to pray for patience. Lord's going to give it to you anyway. Amen. He's going to put you in positions and places to build your patience, whether you ask for it or not, because He loves you too much not to. He, did you get that? He loves you too much to not to. 
as a child begins to grow, Ashton's going to find this out. Daniel and Kendra, y'all found this out with Corbin. You're going to find it out with Kenley. Others are finding this out. That child, as it begins to stand up on its own and begins, it begins to want to walk, but it's scared. As a parent, you look at that child and you realize that child wants to get from here to here. And it looks to you, it says, uh, 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 uh. And you look at it and say, some of you, I know what you say, yo, bitch, you poor little heart, come here. You having trouble getting over here, let me take you over here. Oh, bless your little heart. And your little baby's got weak knees and can't stand up. But those who are wise love their children too much to do it for them. So what they do, they get down over here and say, come on, you want it, come, come get it. Come on over here, come on get it. And so I go, ah, come on, you can get it. Ah, you can get it. And you see the child begin to try. Whether it's crawling or whether it's walking, you see them begin to try and you see them fall. And you see them fail. And you see them stumble. And you see them cry. But you love them too much to do it for them. Because you know there's only one way for them to get the strength to do it on their own. And that is for them to do it. They didn't ask you to. They asked you to do the exact opposite. But you love them too much. You ever realize God loves you too much to listen to you whine from time to time? You see what you want and you know what you want. You believe it to be the will of God, but you don't think you're strong enough to get there. You don't think you have the faith enough to do it. So all you do is get in your prayer closet. You go, ah, ah. And the Lord just stands over there by the object that has captivated your faith and said, come on, come on. you can do this. Come on, you can do this. And you may, you may stumble, you may fall, you may fail, but He loves you too much to come get you and carry you. He makes you do it on your own. Why is that? Because He is building a determination in you that can only be built in that way. So you got determination. The last thing we need is motivation. Isn't He wonderful to give us the motivation that He gave us? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down to the right hand of the throne of God. Can I tell you, that's who we're looking to. We're running, looking to Jesus. We have motivation for the race. We've seen what the church is, what the church needs. Let's close now with what the church has. I'll run through these quickly. And we'll be done. Number one, the church has got the right facts. There's nothing wrong with what we believe. Don't criticize it. Don't claim to believe something else. Don't change what you believe. There's nothing wrong with what we believe. We stand on the Word of God. You say, well, my coworkers, they don't believe that anymore. They used to believe that. They don't believe it anymore. So I'm wondering, do we need to change what we believe? There's nothing wrong with the facts that we have. We've got God's inerrant, inspired, infallible Word. We stand upon the Word of God. The church has the facts. We have the right facts. Secondly, we've got the right foundation. We read about it. Christ is the foundation of the church. We don't need a new foundation. We've got the right formation. Acts 2, 47, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We got the right formation. We're built the right way. We've got the right fellowship. First John 1, 3 through 7, that which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truth, our fellowship was with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in light as He is in the light, listen, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin fellowship we've got the right fellowship there's no one I'd rather be around than the church no one no one I'd rather be around than the church can I tell you when you quit fellowshipping with the church 
you are erring. When you begin to withdraw from the church, you are erring. We don't withdraw. We get in. There's a natural tendency to want to be by ourselves from time to time. Sometimes when we want to be our, by ourselves, it's the worst possible time to be by ourselves. We need the fellowship of the church. There's nobody I'd rather be around than the church. One of the things I love about our church is the fact we do fellowship. Now, I know we don't always go out to eat together. Or we don't always, we're not always together, but we, we get here early many times. Amen. Amen. We get here early. We stay late. We stay late. I, I don't know what it is, but I've come to the conclusion that I'm going to be one of the last ones to leave the church regardless of what church I'm at. Doesn't matter. If I'm here, I'm visiting the church. We were somewhere not long ago. We were visiting the church. First time we'd ever been there. And I looked around and everyone was gone. It was just us and the pastor and a few other people. And I looked around, and the pastor was standing by the door going like this. He goes, <laughs> I said, huh, I guess it's time to go now. It's just part of it. I love fellowship. I love being around God's people. I love it. It's got the right fellowship. We've got the right financial system. 1 Corinthians 6, 2, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you by, uh, lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Can I tell you the tithes and offerings that God's commanded to give to the church is the right financial system. I firmly believe, I believe this is true for every church. If every church member tithed and gave biblical offerings as God directed him, the church would never have Financial struggles. Never. Say so why? Because if you obey God in your giving, if everyone obeys God in his giving, and we have financial struggles, God messed up on his plan. Not with me now. God didn't mess up on his plan. God did not mess up on his plan. We have messed up on our giving a few times. We got the right financial system. And then lastly, we've got the right future. Revelation twenty two fourteen. blessed are they that do his commandments. They have the right, the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and adulterers and uh, or idolaters, whosoever loveth the maker of the lie. Jesus has sent mine angel to testify unto those things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Can I tell you, one of these days, we're going home. That's the right future. Amen. I'm not looking for a better future. You, you say, well, preacher, I got something better than what you... I promise you, you ain't got a better future than I do. So you don't know my education. I don't know your education, but I do know my Savior. Amen. And your education may give you a better future here, but you cannot beat the future that I have in Jesus Christ. As many have said, working for the Lord is wonderful and the benefits are out of this world. Amen. Or maybe it's the retirement plan is out of this world. Either way, we've got the right future, church. We're not going down. We are going up. We are the church. The church. Thank God for the church. Let's stand to our feet tonight.